So, uh, oh, look, a um, so Cypher, Cypher APIs in context, what are we trying to talk about here? So some of you may have seen this uh, delightful rainbow picture. I guess they fixed the projection. Um, this is the, the Cypher API kind of reference architecture thing. And we're not going to walk through this whole thing now. Uh, if you're interested, it's in the Cypher wiki um, in Internet 2 spaces. Um, but the point of this is to show the various pieces and how they're coming together. And everywhere you see a red line connecting pieces or a dotted red line uh, connecting pieces is uh, where there's a connectivity point. Um, and those are potential integration points where you know, possibly an API could come into play or not. But the point is there's a lot of them. And um, we should perhaps be thinking about this uh, um, so, uh, so Cypher API is in words rather than pictures. What are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to increase the interoperability of the various Cypher components. I'm assuming people more or less know what Cypher is. Actually, nobody knows what Cypher is, but I'm assuming people have enough familiarity with Cypher at the moment to pretend they know what it is. Um, if you don't, that's uh, a previous session, so you can go back in time and find that one. Um, or, or, it's lethal. Um, uh, or you can uh, find information on the wiki or come talk to us uh, separately. Uh, uh, we'll just assume, for the most part, uh, that the audience uh, at least has heard the phrase Cypher before. Uh, so the APIs are designed to increase the interoperability of components in Cypher land, uh, as well as to allow greater flexibility for campuses to, to choose the products they want to run and then replace them when three years later they decide it was a bad idea and go with something else. Um, the APIs also have the ability, conceptually, to provide a migration path from custom and priority systems. So if there is a Cypher component you want to use, but you want to integrate it with um, uh, some of your existing stuff, the APIs allow you to do that. Uh, we have a couple of examples of this coming up uh, in the slide deck uh, that may resonate a bit. Um, and also, there's this thing about making it easier for developers to work with the data uh, that's um, accessed via the APIs. Um, I guess most or many of us sometimes still write code, and things that make our lives easier is good because we're lazy. Um, so Cypher APIs are for lazy people. So uh, APIs in design. Uh, so there are about four or five that have been identified so far. This is not necessarily the complete set. Um, Maybe it will be, but probably there'll be some more uh, over time. Um, we'll talk a little bit about each of these. The SOR for registry API, um, which is kind of what it sounds like, uh, also has kind of attached to it this thing called the core schema. Um, I think we talk about the core schema a little bit coming up. So for now, let me just do the inventory and we'll come back for details. Uh, there's the ID match API. And if you were at the ID match session earlier today, um, this is the, the under the hood bits that um, you didn't see going across the wire. Um, there's the registry extraction e API, which is a thing for provisioning. Um, there's the authorization standard API, which we usually just call the group API, uh, which uh, Chris will talk a little bit about. And then uh, there's a proposed API for account and credential management, which there's not really any there there at the moment. It's just sort of a concept that's been thrown around. So we actually won't talk about that one in any more detail. But if that resonates with you for some reason, certainly mention that at some point. And perhaps we should have a conversation on that. Uh, so let's go through some of these. The SOR to register API, uh, this one's sort of an early design um, status. Uh, all of the details of this can be found in the Internet to Wiki and the Cypher slash API uh, space. Um, I think there's a link to that at the end of the deck. Um, but um, uh, we'll talk about some of the details here, but if you want to go study it for whatever reason, you can check out the web pages. Uh, and certainly provide feedback. None of this is, is final in any way, shape, or form. Um, but the idea of the SR to registry API is to provide a mechanism for, for moving data from your system of records, so your HR system, your students, et cetera, um, into an identity registry, so open registry or CPR. Um, and actually, for these design calls, we've had representatives from both projects working on this. So we, we, you know, if that's not a test for making sure this is not a project-specific solution, um, we're happy to hear what other ones, uh, what other tests might be there. Um, in the model of the API, a system record can only be authoritative for its own roles. So this is a student, this is a faculty. Let's not try to uh, uh, 
exactly define what rule means in this context. We'll use the Supreme Court definition that we know it when we see it. Um, but uh, a system of record can only be authoritative for its own roles and not for a person. Uh, it's the identity registry that maintains the canonical view of where a person is. Um, and we can see this a little bit in uh, some excerpts. So APIs are, are generally restfully kind of things. Um, they look kind of like this. Um, in this particular example, uh, we have a request that's using separate person level and role level attributes uh, for persons. So there's actually three requests going across the wire here. Um, the left one uh, puts a uh, post. Um, uh, we had a big conversation about post versus put. So if you really feel enthusiastically strongly about what means what post means, what put means, uh, uh, join the list and send a note. Uh, but uh, in the leftmost here is just sending the person level attributes. Um, a name, a data forth in this example, um, and there's a, a structure to the URL, which is the um, uh, tag SOR people, and then the system of record label, whatever you end up calling that, and then the system of record ID. So HRMS is the human resources system, X12345 is the identifier of the human resources system assigned to that person, it's people soft, for example, Temple ID. And then uh, in this uh, scenario, it's making three requests, uh, one to put the person level attributes, and then two to attach two different roles uh, for that person. And in these examples, the R98765 are the, uh, the role identifiers of the uh, system of record um, For the SOR to registry API, we have two or three different versions of this because we realize there are differences between how systems of record represent data and how, and how identity registries represent data. Uh, so this is just one of the models uh, for doing it. Um, they look sort of the same, but they're not exactly the same. Um, and again, just a reality check. I don't think we have even proof of concept implementations of this. Um, this is kind of a thought exercise. You know, there are one or two use cases bubbling up that may change that options in the future. Uh, this is basically the same data going across, but with person level attributes expressed as role level attributes. So the idea here is that the, um, <coughs> the registry can't tell them apart, or maybe the system of records is not capable of conveying them separately. Uh, actually, it could be either. Um, and so we have two requests going across the wire. You'll notice in the URL, they're going in the same person, but different roles underneath that same person. And some of the attributes are simply repeated. Updates and deletes kind of look like what you think they do. Uh, not terribly exciting. We could discuss whether it's better to put just a single attribute or whether to be put the whole record. Um, yes. Um, and then a delete is a delete. Uh, obviously, there's a whole bunch of return booths specified for these as well. Uh, I, I probably have better things to do with inventory than right now, but um, uh, you know, they're the usual HTTP return booths, 200, 200, so. Um, as part of this, we have the core schema. Uh, and the intent of the core schema is to provide common attributes and types for the APIs. Uh, we came up with it uh, by doing a very exhaustive comparison of the higher ed and research oriented registries and protocols, um, of which you can see the list right there. Um, maybe one or two more that are now on that list. Um, as well as recognizing that there is a need for extensions for locally defined attributes. We're not going to get 100% of everybody's attributes officially defined. We'll get into the high 90s and give you a mechanism for the last 2%. That's probably not bad. So the person level attributes that we've identified, uh, there are about a dozen of them. Uh, they probably look pretty familiar. I um, don't know if there's any that's interesting to talk about right now, other than to say they're structured a little bit. So it says address, but you can break that down a bit into street and uh, locality and city, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, those are the person level attributes. Um, we also have person role level attributes, uh, some of which are the same, but many of which are different. So there's quite a few more of these, um, including various data assignments. Uh, not on these slides. There are a few um, attributes to find kind of that are SOR specific, so you can imagine some HR data or some uh, student data that kind of looks alike across all campuses. And uh, so we identified a few attributes that are uh, they're listed in the wiki if you can navigate to the core schema page. 
uh, that has the full definitions for all of them. Also. So uh, some of you might be looking at this and thinking, well, wait, isn't this just SCIM? What are you guys doing? Um, SCIM, for those of you who don't know, is the System for Cross-Domain Identity Management. That is the new acronym definition. The old one was Simple Cloud Identity Now. Uh, thus, the URL is simplecloud.info. Um, but the API work was started as an exercise to identify a solution that was suitable for the research and education communities. Uh, we wanted to start in a vacuum so as not to be influenced in what we were doing. Um, the sort of next step is to analyze what we did and realize that hey, maybe we did just read that. Um, I think our sort of initial reaction to that is there's definitely a fair amount of overlap for some of the APIs. Uh, it's not 100%. And so one question is, can we get there by looking at skim extensions? Um, or are some of the things just way out in left field as far as skim is concerned? So ID match is not something that necessarily maps as well into the SCIM model, whereas passing along person information and even simple group information might map a little bit better. Um, if you're interested in that, by the way, as a conversation, uh, you should definitely follow up with us. We'll be having more of those conversations and not just small future. Um, that probably applies for this entire slide. Actually. I'll just keep saying that for every slide. Uh, so the ID Match API. Uh, this one's actually quite a bit further along. Um, the proof of concept that was demonstrated earlier today is largely based, uh, or largely implements the draft ID Match API. Um, a few little nits here and there that need to be cleaned up. Uh, um, but the API was designed to work um, either from within the identity management system or as a standalone service that the systems of record all. Um, it follows the same design paradigm as the system of record to registry API. So the, the SOR can only assert role data for its own population. It can't say, I have a person. It can say, I have a new staff member. And the ID Match API follows that same model. Uh, the goal of the ID Match API is to obtain a reference identifier, which is basically a string that canonically represents that person uh, within the potential match database. Um, the strings can be pretty much anything that makes sense. So it could be specific to the ID match engine. It could be your already pre-existing system to system identifier or net ID maybe is not ideal. It should be something persistent, not something user visible. Um, uh, the proof of concept just, I believe, generates more or less a random string. But uh, um, the equivalent to that at Berkeley anyway is the UID, which is a campus internal private uh, so the goal of the match operation, again, is just to get that number. Uh, what happens under the hood to get that number is mostly left as an exercise to the engine with a little bit of guidance from the API. Uh, this is a repeat of the slide if you were in the earlier session. Uh, if not, we'll walk through it a little bit. But basically, these are the two um, almost unreadable flows uh, through, the, uh, through the ID match process, where a system of record starts in the top left by adding a new person. And then depending on which model of integration we're following, either the system of record notifies the identity management system, which then calls the match API, or the system of record natively calls the match API and gets the uh, yeah, uh, The rest of that is sort of the flow through what happens if you get an ambiguous match and how you resolve that. Um, and uh, if you create a new person, perhaps you would create some identifiers and so on. So, um, there is a version of this in one of the wiki spaces uh, that would be easier to read, but probably the better solution is what we'll the slide deck and then see if you know, Or if featured slide deck is already up, what we could actually look at that. Uh, so going across the wire, what do we have? Uh, this is an ID match reference identifier request. And formatted a little bit weirdly just so it fits on the screen. Um, but you'll notice the, the URL that the foot request is going to looks very similar to the one from the system of record uh, to registry request. So we've got some prefix, and then we've got the system of record label, which in this example is the student system, SIS. Um, and then the 97 number is the student system's identifier for the person that it's trying to match. Uh, the payload is a bunch of attributes about the person. Um, this one is actually, I believe, using the core schema proposed uh, attribute names and the way of representing it. So. There's an official name, a uh, date of birth. Um, the identifier, in this case, it's an encrypted national identifier or a hashed national identifier. 
uh, IE SSM. Um, uh, and then uh, we also pass along the telephone number as an matching attribute. Uh, the Strongman doesn't specify what attributes you need to send across. It's assumed that out of band, the, uh, the client and the engine have agreed as to what attributes are going to be used for matching. Uh, the responses that come across would then be ones you might more or less expect. Uh, so a 200 OK uh, returns a reference ID and indicates that it found an existing person. A 201 created is functionally equivalent from the standpoint of the client, but it indicates that a new person was created. Both of those return the reference ID, which in this case is just an M prefix number for, for uh, sample purposes. Uh, 202 and 300 responses are the fuzzy match responses. So in the 202 accepted, the system of record making the call is not capable of doing interactive resolution of the, the conflict. So it gets a match request ID, and that's it. Um, the presumably out of band, the um, ID match engine is notified whoever is in charge of uh, reconciling manually the, uh, the request, um, gets an email or something, and then they can log in through that UI that was demonstrated earlier. Uh, the 300 multiple choices is the scenario where the system of record is capable of handling the response uh, from the interactive response from the uh, match engine. Um, and uh, so it gets the match request ID as well, but it also gets a list of candidates that it can present back to the, back to the user, uh, whoever's doing it. <coughs> uh, for purposes of squishing things onto slides, the attributes are omitted, but you can imagine same sort of thing that was on the previous slide. Uh, beyond that, there are a few additional operations. So get pending matches um, basically just pulls the list of attributes of, of pending matches uh, for the uh, user interface to present to the person in charge of doing the manual reconciliation. The forced reconciliation request is the, uh, the programmatic response to a 300 multiple choices response. So if your system of record is capable of interactively resolving uh, a match, then um, it issues a forced reconciliation request to say, no, this time it's really this person. Don't give me a 300 again. Just make the link. And it basically looks like the original request, but it has the match uh, identifier or the reference identifier um, of the candidate. Uh, um, and then the last one is the support operation of getting and updating match attributes. So the scenario here is imagine somebody um, gets hired, and then six months later, they change their name for whatever reason. Uh, well, we don't need to match them anymore because we've already assigned them a net ID or whatever. Uh, but we do need to get their new name into the match database uh, so that when they become a student, for example, their new name is updated and will match against the record that comes from the student system. Um, now, this is actually an optional part of the implementation because it depends on how your match engine is actually implemented. If your match engine is a standalone database, then it definitely needs the ability to receive these updates. On the other hand, if your match engine is built on top of views of your identity registry, well, then when your identity registry gets the name update, the match engine will automatically have the name update. It doesn't actually need this request. Uh, so very much an implementation of the thing. So that's the match API. Uh, the next one is the registry extraction API. And so the idea of this, um, it's a, we really like the name because it's kind of like pulling teeth. So we figure there's pain in getting the data out of the registry to find to the dentist. Um, but the registry extraction API is effectively a, an outbound provisioning uh, API. This one is very much an early design. We, we think we have a handle on the types of things we want to do, but um, uh, there's probably a fair amount of iteration over the, the design of this thing that needs to happen. Uh, broadly speaking, we think there's two models, basically push and pull. Uh, where a, a downstream system can pull data from the registry whenever it needs it or wants it. Uh, this is not really the LDAP model so much as a, you know, a provisioning system that's going to pull every five or ten months for changes. Um, you know, if, if what you want is to do real-time pulling out of the registry on demand because somebody logs into a web application, that may or may not be this API. Uh, there's probably some discussion around that. Uh, the push model would be the registry has a change and it sends out a notification from ESB or, or whatever. Um, this is sort of a diagram representing this where uh, we've got the registry in the top right, um, some top, you know, some tightly integrated applications. For example, the thing that builds LDAP 
might be uh, um, receiving or might be directly pulling the registry for uh, updates of the read API versus um, you know, the provisioning engine or message bus, which might actually be uh, just getting notifications. Uh, the way the notifications would work, for example, actually we'll get up to a slide on this, but basically they'd just be getting a very simple message telling them to go find out what the river it is that you need. That's kind of why there's a dotted line and a solid line going to the uh, message bus there. Uh, and then eventually that would integrate with your downstream applications. You know, one open question is what really should the registry be talking to? Should it be talking to all your downstream apps or should it just be talking to the message bus or provisioning engine and like that and do all the pretty work? So the pull API looks a little bit like this. Um, uh, this is basically a request that says, tell me all the events since the last you know, number that you told me. Uh, so serial number is in um, And in this scenario, it actually conveys relatively little data. It basically says, here's the person you want to go look at. But again, this is a very early design. We could certainly contemplate providing more, uh, providing more rich data set or uh, different types of data, different types of downstream applications. We started with the very simplest version, which is, you know, here's the resource that you want to go look at, and then you can go figure out what you need to call that data. Um, so that's the entity and timestamps and timestamp. The push API from the registry to the downstream system, basically the same concept. An event happens, so it puts it to a specific URL. Um, probably a little bit of discussion about what that URL should really look like. Uh, again, with the entity reference as to what resource you should go look at to see what happened, um, and then the time uh, So I'll just talk a little bit briefly about some use cases for Cypher APIs uh, before handing it over to Chris. Um, and so let me talk a little bit about the Cypher APIs at UCB and UCSF. Uh, as you possibly saw earlier today, the ID match API is being implemented by the ID match engine. Uh, and, and the intent is for that batch engine to be integrated in two different ways. Uh, UCSF will call it directly from the system of records, whereas Berkeley will integrate it via the identity management system. The transition path here is that we deploy the ID match engine, um, and then the current sync code, which is the Perl code that's currently doing matching, will basically update that. It does a lot more than just matching, so what we'll do is we'll turn off the matching portion of it and replace it with a call out to the ID match API. Um, meanwhile, we'll stand up open registry in parallel, and we'll configure it to call out to the match engine via the ID match API. This is actually kind of interesting for us because we think this is going to allow us to avoid a flag day transition. Um, because in theory, data should be able to process through both the sync code and open registry simultaneously, and it doesn't matter which one happens first because the second one will just get the same reference identifier that the first one. Uh, which might actually uh, make our parallel production stage a little bit easier than we thought. Uh, we haven't obviously tested this out yet, but, um, but we're a little hopeful about that. Uh, and actually, the other related thing is we would also do identifier assignment over the same uh, protocol. Uh, the ID match API has the ability to convey identifiers over the wire, so if we update the ID match engine and be doing identifier assignment as well, then whichever one sees the person first will trigger the identifier assignment. Uh, and the other one will just get the results later. So that's Berkeley NSF. I'll also talk a little bit about what NYU is doing. Um, ignore the right-hand side of these slides where we talk about credential API. So uh, NYU has a homegrown registry, which they're planning on replacing with a product at some point. Uh, they also, that homegrown registry currently does the ID match operations. Um, the intent is to replace ID match not with an open source product, but with the Oracle Heck. Uh, uh, service um, as part of a larger kind of data cleanup uh, project. So the uh, idea for this is the first thing we'll do is we'll take uh, the existing, in this case it's the onboarding form and the registry feed processing. It's actually six different things, but it's just two on this diagram. And we'll rewrite them to call the match API instead of to be doing their own native internal matching. But we'll also write the match API um, to call a plugin that talks to the registry API. Um, uh, um, so effectively, we're going to extract the matching through an API layer. Once that's done and, and HEC comes online, we'll basically redirect the API to talk to HEC. And then once the new registry gets deployed, we'll just, uh, at that point, we won't need to do anything with the match API, but the part I kind of glossed over was HEC also is providing information to the registry. So the third phase is we'll 
reconnect heck to the registry uh, directly. Um, so basically using the APIs both to transition legacy code and to integrate with um, um, I'm going to pause here because we're kind of uh, we're already about two thirds of the way through and I want to give Chris some time to, uh, to talk about uh, the group APIs. <laughs> Hello, Chris Heiser from University of Pennsylvania and Invent2, and I'm going to talk about the um, Cypher authorization API. Um, we can skip the agenda, you'll see next time when we get there. Description. So the authorization APIs um, for Cypher are RESTful APIs for groups and permissions. Um, basically, the main point is to describe the resources and the operations, the methods, or whatever um, to get put, post, delete. Um, to manage authorizations in a standard way. The payloads can be JSON or XML. And basically, this project is structured a little bit differently where we wanted to not define the whole API at first, but to, to as we go, um, do some reference implementations of things so we can see it work and see what, um, what issues we have uh, while implementing it. So we've been talking about this for a long time at conferences. And just recently, over the last year, um, I and Jim Fox and Ben and Scotty Logan and some other people, I didn't really look at exactly who's been involved, but these are probably the main ones. Um, uh, basically, we, we've been trying to come up with a design and implementation and review the, um, the reference implementation as we go. We've met at two, two conferences. Um, and then things stalled a little bit. Um, hopefully we'll start up again. If anyone's interested in um, contributing, um, that would be useful. So the point of this, in addition to what Ben said about Cypher in general, is to make it easy for applications to interface with central authorization. So um, even if, if Cypher didn't exist, we'd still want a standard way for packages or software or APIs to talk about groups and permissions. Um, and then, as Ben said, also you can, if you have a standard API, um, you have more of a chance to be able to switch authorization services if you want to um, to change to something else. And um, a lot of the central authorization, um, at least open source products like Grouper and Quali, perhaps, um, this is a chance to sort of modernize the, the API into more of a restful, um, simple um, way to um, have web services. So um, basically, we've um, we're doing more than just what what's uh, how is a group represented. Uh, we're talking about how the JSON is going to um, be described on the server with a default resource, being able to drill down from there and sort of self-discover what resources are available. Um, versioning, we want things to be backwards compatible. So that as you upgrade the authorization service, um, all the applications that are using it don't have to worry. Uh, multiple formats, like I said, JSON and XML. Paging and sorting for things that have large lists, which happen in authorization. Um, so we've described the folder resource and the, and the group resource. Um, authentication is not currently specified. Maybe it should be to make it more pluggable, but right now we're not tackling that aspect of it. So an example with how we've integrated with Grouper right now is um, basically a service, um, either at an institution or the cloud, um, might use the, the standard authorization client, which I'll talk about, which will speak the authorization standard API. And that can go to the authorization standard API reference server or your own implementation. And right now, that reference server has a Google, uh, Google a Grouper API plugin, which is actually a Grouper registry. Um, also, the, the client um, has a, a test suite that you could run against any um, Aussie standard API server, whether it's the reference server or not, um, that can check to make sure that it's up to the spec. So the reference server is a Java reference implementation of the authorization API. Again, you don't have to use it. <clears throat> the protocol is the most important part of this. Um, but if you have a Java um, authorization service, it's probably easier to use the, the reference server than not. 
uh, all you have to do is implement some job interfaces. So what it is is it's one jar with no dependencies. You can throw that into your central authorization service. Um, you can run it as a web app that uses a client to talk to your authorization service, or you could just throw it inside of your, um, your, your web app and just map a servlet. Um, so basically the thought is there, if you take Grouper for an example, if you know the Grouper architecture, if you were using this with the Grouper client, um, you're probably going to get worse performance than if you're using this directly with the Grouper API that talks directly to the database. <clears throat> so we wanted the flexibility to have this be a, a high performance um, server that wouldn't have to have a couple hops to get to the actual um, authorization decision. So the reference server does the authentication. It does the formatting JSON to XML. It does the versioning, any versioning that's required. Boilerplate fields um, in the um, RESTful protocol, we're going to describe self-URIs and URIs to other resources, et cetera, the statuses and other things. So the reference client is similar to the grouper client, where it's also one jar with no dependencies. It implements both the JSON and the XML, which is different from groupers. Grouper only does um, XML. Uh, fully implements the um, Cypher authorization standard API. And you can use it as a command line or a Java API. So again, this isn't something that you have to use, but to get up and running quickly, you could use it for a command line test. Or if you have a Java application, it's probably easier to use this and to write your own um, implementation of the client. So the test harness that's included in the client <coughs> is non-destructive. You specify a, um, a folder that you're allowed to work with, and then it's going to create and delete data inside that folder while it runs its test to you know, add members to groups or assign permissions, and then see if those users have those permissions, et cetera, and make sure that all the various parts of the API are coming back in the right way. So I can't test everything. Because it tests everything, you'd probably have to go and check the root folder and stuff like that. Um, but it's going to do um, basically the best it can and be able to run on, on a production system um, without having to, to wipe away the database. So an example of that. I have a link of um, an example of the output. Um, so you run it. It tries to get the default resource. It checks a whole bunch of the fields. And there, there are various levels of uh, how verbose you want the output to be. Um, but basically, you know, it's going to see that the status code is right. It's going to see that various things aren't null. It's going to see that the URIs are what they're supposed to be. And it goes all the way down to you know, creating a folder, making sure the right status code comes back, using that folder to create other objects, et cetera. So, um, so hopefully this will be a good way to test people's implementations of the, of the API. So the grouper implementation, um, uh, Whatever we've specified in the API so far, we've implemented. And we've basically implemented the interface for the reference server against Grouper, um, actually back to v2.0. Um, and um, we've mapped the servlet in the Grouper WS and put it up on the Grouper uh, demo server um, so people can actually go and see the, the um, Cypher authorization standard API work. And you can run the Cypher client against this, obviously. And basically, I'm going to show a couple screens. I don't know if you can see it or if you want to move forward or if you really care about um, uh, some of the other resources. So this is um, basically the, the root resource. And the root resource is going to specify two URIs <laughs> to talk about how to go down the JSON path or the XML path. And then um, we didn't really want to assume that people are going to always be using HTTP for this. So a lot of the things that are in HTTP, like the status code 200, we're going to put that in the um, in the message itself in case you're using messaging or some other um, payload that isn't HTTP based. Um, so basically, then you know that there's a JSON in an XML format. You can drill down to the JSON one. Inside the JSON one, you can drill down to the various versions that are there. Right now, we only have version one. Um, from there, you can drill down to. Let's see. Um, here's groups, which is going to list all the groups in a paged way. And I, um, 
hid some of the details of the groups. But basically, um, inside the group, there are some things we're going to send by default, like the name and the ID, display name. And then we'll have URIs to go to other parts, like to the admins list or the members list or the updaters list, et cetera. And so really, um, the protocol sort of documents itself to see what's available and, and, uh, and what you can use. Um, for versioning, um, REST makes this pretty easy. We're, we're saying that you know, fields that you're not expected that, that you're not expecting that are come back are going to ignore. So as we add fields on the server, clients should be able to ignore them safely without breaking. Um, the client's going to send its version to the server, so the server can use that information to um, maybe that affects the way it does its logic, and vice versa. The client will see which version the server is. Um, if we do a major rewrite, then um, we'll add a v in addition to v1, the v2, v3, etc. Um, but my plan, at least, is to um, try to keep the old versions as well, so that um, you don't have, you know, these times where all clients need to be upgraded at once. <laughs> so related work. Um, there's an Oasis um, group about cloud authorization that I've been participating in a little bit, um, and they're they're not making a simple protocol, but they're talking about a lot of com complexity. Um, also, Skim that uh, Ben was talking about. Um, has some group um, calls, and they do messaging and um, and web services. And um, basically, SurfNet has a requirement to use Skim with Grouper, and so I'm probably going to be um, shifting my efforts away from from this effort to integrate um, Skim with Grouper. And uh, Skim is a standard too, so you could think of that as sort of a standard API. I don't know if it's going to um, handle everything that uh, that Cipher needs when they um, think about a standard authorization service, um, but at least it goes in the direction of a standard um, authorization web service API. So we can see if uh, if it's enough. So like I said before, we're we're shifting away from this. Grouper Skim is a higher priority, um, and we can use contributors. So if anyone is interested, um, you know, let me know. So if you Google Cypher Authorization API, we have a bunch of documentation up there and um, a way to get the code and, and run the server, the reference stuff. Um, there are the two addresses. The email list is cypher-api at internet2.edu. And uh, we've been having um, calls every other week, Wednesday at noon Eastern time. Um, sometimes we skip them, but I know there's definitely going to be one next Wednesday, so if you're interested, you could join and. and uh, Tell us what your what your interests are. Are you trying to give me a five minute warning? I never looked at you. <laughs> uh, any questions? All right. Thanks a lot.